Shit. <laughs> so, uh, I hear you've us. been digging around. We have been digging around quite a bit, yeah. Okay. We've been found some good stuff, I think, we're going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but first, a brief uh, couple of words. Uh, when we asked you uh, what you wanted for a bio, uh, you wrote to us, we should write something along the lines of handsome, young, charming man in his best years, <laughs> or entrepreneur, executive, and angel investor with 20 years of digital experience. Whatever you want. So we wrote actually both, uh, mm -hmm. both of it, and uh, and probably this is, I guess, what is what part of the interview is going to be about. But hopefully, we didn't do any spoiler alerts uh, for us. Yeah, this point. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for coming, um, Klaus. Uh, uh, the way we usually try to do it is to try to to understand where you come from and, and stuff. So so where did you grow up? In Jutland, of course, uh, of course. the backbone of Denmark. Uh, <laughs> it's called uh, Midtjylland, the, the, the heart, that's the center of Jutland. It's a very small town. Uh, kind of village called Gern. Gern Bagger, maybe some of you guys know about it. There's a wolf yeah. roaming around the area <laughs> these days. Uh, it's close to Silkeborg, where I went to gymnasium, and it's like 40 kilometers away from Aarhus. Okay. Were startups kind of obvious to do when you grew up in that area, or? Back then, I remember, I'm older than most people here, I'm from 1970. Mm -hmm. Back then, you did not have the concept of startups, really. Uh, and the word entrepreneur in the NEC back center was not used that much, so uh, we didn't talk about it uh, the way we talk about it today. What I wanted to, uh, so I actually, what I really wanted to do, I wanted to be a soldier. Uh, because when I was five years old, I heard about some Spitfires that shot down some Messerschmitts during the war some years earlier. Uh, and that sounded pretty cool. Uh, but then I got glasses when I was in gymnasium, and I realized, okay, I can't be a, I can't be a special forces uh, soldier, so I need to do something else, so I become an, uh, an economist. And uh, what I really want to do, if you sort of look at the, the teenage years, was to, to build companies. But building companies, again, back then you didn't talk about as you're doing it today. Back then it was about, uh, at least the, the, the way I interpreted it was, you would, you would kind of you know, do your education, you would enter a big corporation, big international corporation, and you do well, you head up a business unit and you're gonna do a leverage buyout of this company and you're gonna build it from there. That's kind of how I thought about building companies if you go back to sort of, uh, you know, late 80s. Okay. So, 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 so the switch from, uh, from, from, from a soldier to, to economics seems a bit far. I mean, what, what attracted you to economics? Um, I was and I am still very interested in uh, everything re related to society. Uh, and I felt that uh, studying political science was just too easy, it was fluffy. I could do that by reading newspapers, um, uh, and I still think so. Uh, <laughs> but actually, if you study economics at the university, then you would get some, some really hardcore tools that could help you to, to understand the environment. And also, I was interested in microeconomics, part of it, you know, the company side of it. And I felt, therefore, economics was a good mix of you know, the company side and, and sort of understanding society a bit better. Okay, okay, okay. By the way, what, 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 what did your parents do? I mean, did they do something similar or? I mean, what no, 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 no. So I'm from a family of uh, veterinarians in three generations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and my, my, my mother is a physiotherapist. Uh, we were four brothers. Uh, uh, I was the youngest, and who could tell? Uh, and they are, so the oldest, he's, he's, a, he's a professor of medicine. Uh, the next one, he's uh, an economist just like me, um, and the youngest, he's an uh, veterinary. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, but what did you call the town that you grew up in again? Gan. Gan. Where? What? Where did you go from there? I mean, when you were. So um, I went to Aarhus to study economics, mm -hmm. and I uh, so I lived there for four years. So basically, the the the, the entire sort of. Uh, no master with Kenny Cohn in Danish, uh, excluding I went half a year to a school in the UK. To it was an MBA school, but I only took third and fourth term, so I started some some business over there as well. Hmm. Okay, and then I went to Copenhagen. Okay, wait, okay, okay. And in Copenhagen, that was when you joined McKinsey, or is yes, that right? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay, okay. And what what did you do with McKinsey? I mean, I know what they do. Work for big fat corporations, <laughs> trying to help them out. <laughs> okay, and then you get an. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what you do with McKinsey. You know, you work for very big corporations that, that are 
having problems with bureaucracy and politics and trying to sort out the, the mess. It, that's not really how you position a project, but that's kind of almost what a project is about. Okay, okay, okay. You also do a lot of good stuff, to be honest, but, but, but it, it is typically for really big corporations that are uh, slow moving. Okay, okay, okay. So, so but I mean, uh, so it seems like there are quite a few startup people, they somehow have something to do with McKinsey, for instance. Mr. Lurie we had last time, she was also doing McKinsey. What does the McKinsey do that just makes people want to go out and... Uh, I don't know how many people have been through McKinsey, okay. and then you, you can calculate the, the, the ratio of McKinsey guys to actual startup guys. Mm -hmm. It should be way, way more. Okay. Uh, it is not about McKinsey, that's not why people become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think you learn some really useful tools when you are at McKinsey, and you learn to set the bar really high, which is good when you build a company. Um, but I think those people, uh, they will become entrepreneurs no matter what. And probably some of them, if they hadn't joined McKinsey, they would probably become entrepreneurs instead of just continuing uh, in, in, in McKinsey. So I, I, I think, you know, you don't, you don't, it's not McKinsey that makes you an entrepreneur, but at McKinsey, you learn some tools that are quite helpful for you when you want to build a company in, 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 in a good way. Um, I think McKinsey is, is uh, you know, you don't stay there for too long. That's kind of, you know, always when you enter a, comp a consultancy company. Uh, if you stay there for too long, you will be a consultant. Uh, especially if you join them when you're really young. Because you get into like a certain mindset that is a bit difficult to get out of. You can, but it's just getting more difficult. So I always say about McKinsey, you know, go there and be there at least two years because that's kind of what you need to learn, uh, to learn all the basics. But don't stay there for more than five or six years because then it, it gets too difficult okay. to break out. Okay. What, what is that mindset? Can you describe it a little bit more? I mean, what is, what is that particular mindset? The, the, the most important thing, I think, is about uh, aspiration level. Setting the benchmark really high in terms of, uh, yeah. you know, work ethics, in terms of uh, the kind of smart people that you work you work with that you that that's around you, uh, how you try to to use, you know, a, a professional thinking to certain key areas. Mm. Um, that's that's it's not not a concrete tool, but those sort of soft factors I think you really get uh, when you at McKinsey. And, and uh, that helped me also because if you, and, you know, we, we touched briefly on my background. Mm -hmm. I'm a redneck, right? I'm from a really small town. Um, um, there's no one uh, that I knew that uh, like worked for you know, big corporations or did like fancy tech stuff or tech this or tech that. If anything, we were, me and my boss, we were like academics, right? Uh, so, so to kind of help you with, with getting into a mindset so you can build companies. McKinsey, for me, was actually quite helpful. I did not join McKinsey to, 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 to become a consultant. I joined because I had a professor at the school I studied at in, 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 in the UK that told me, you should go to McKinsey Club. So I said, no way, I'm not a consultant. I want to build companies in the way I thought I should build companies. He said, yeah, 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 that, that's cool. But actually, if you join McKinsey for a few years, you, you learn a lot, of, a lot of really good tools. And that was true. And then on top of that, I, I, I got this you know, mindset that really helped me to understand what is, you know, there's a lot of really smart people in this world. And they can help you. And, you know, world-class execution is not what I saw uh, when I looked at, uh, at, you know, the small companies in my local area. It's, you know, something completely different. So in, in, in that respect, I think it, it heightened my, my aspirations on, on the business side of my life. Not everybody needs that because... Now, if, if, you are, if you are born in the whiskey belt, you are surrounded by successful people that are you know, doing all kind of sexy things in, in, in various industries, but that's not my background. I'm a redneck, you know, I know how to milk a cow. Uh, so so it, you know, you, I need to, to get some, some other input uh, before I understood that, that other world. Okay, okay. okay so that's why you, you also call yourself a farmer, that's because you can I live on a farm. You do? I live on a farm. You do? Okay. I, uh, I am officially a farm. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. I, I don't have cows, but I am, I'm getting EU subsidies, so that's making me a farm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, cool. Okay. But I mean, some. Uh, okay, so, so from, from McKinsey, how long did you stay at McKinsey? Three years. Three years, okay. Which was one year more than I expected. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I, I told them at the, uh, 
you know, you go through a lot of interviews uh, when you when you join Kings. And I say, is it okay? I only stay for two years. They're like, yeah, cool, that's fine. Okay. And, and generally, it is cool with these guys when, when you only stay for a few years. Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. So, so from from a kid, you went, went and founded your your first company, right? Yes. Yeah, so so. Um, so at McKinsey, I, I got this, I always imagine, oh, these, you know, Novo, no, don't want to men mention the name. Actually, I didn't work for Novo, so I can't say, but I, I, I worked for some big corporations. At least some of them, I, I beforehand, as, 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 as a student at university, had this imagination, these were like truly great companies to work for. Oh, it must be amazing to work for X, Y, and Z. You know, they're cool, they do all these funny products. And then I got on the inside. And I saw they truly were good at a few things. You know, they, they were like super good at you know building industrial stuff at scale, for example. But there was also all these other things about politics and bureaucracy and too many mediocre people, especially at you know even at, at, at the top of the pyramid. Like, what is going on here? And I then they had to, had to hire a consultant, you know, twenty five year old guy like me, running around trying to help. You know, it was a bit weird. So I took a very clear decision. Actually, the big corporation corporate stuff is not me. I should never ever. Do that. I actually later on uh, kind of default on that one. We can come back to that. Uh, that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is the the company thing is, is entrepreneurship, like the Silicon Valley way. And and this was around the time when when the internet came out as a commercial uh, service. It's around the time that Yahoo uh, they stock listed and this small company, founded by some young guys, had this massive valuation, lots of hype, and you know they could change the world. So I realized, wow, that is really interesting. You know. Biotechnology or information technology. The two technologies that can really change the world, I should be part of that. You know, it, it's, it's my time. Biotechnology, really long development cycles. So you, you do something, and then after 10 years, the mice, they die. Shit, you have to start all over. Information technology, much faster feedback loop. Uh, and, and probably also a little bit easier for me to, to understand. Uh, so I went for information technology, and I had an idea to a company I wanted to, uh, to, to, to to start, sort of greenfield. Mm -hmm. And then I was approached, I also talked to to, uh, to a couple of other guys about joining their, their startups and so on. Um, but then, then, then I was uh, contacted by uh, a former colleague uh, who worked for, for Shifted, which is a, a big Norwegian uh, media corporation. Back then they were like a classic traditional media corporation, just like you know the old guys we have in this country. But they really wanted to change the company to make it a you know new media company, multimedia company, as you call it back then in in, in, in the mid nineties. And uh, and and what they had seen, which I think was incredibly innovative, and very courageous of, of a fairly big corporation from Norway, um, was that if they should become a success, they needed uh, in, in this complete new uh, area where you didn't know what the product was, you didn't know what the service was, you didn't know what the business model was, but you didn't know anything you needed to attack the problem with, a, with an entrepreneurial organization. So you should, build, you should build these new companies with entrepreneurs. So what they said is, what do you think about you know, working together with another guy, the Norwegian guy, we found, you guys together as entrepreneurs, you start this company. And it, it's, 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 like, you know, it's like funded, like a VC fund, we just put in, you put in money, and you put in the time, and we put in a lot of money. It's, and of course we are a majority, but we, you, you get a lot of, Freedom, you don't get protection really, you know, you, you have to sort out this, this yourself. So, and I thought, well, that's actually a pretty cool way of starting my entrepreneurial life, or my entrepreneurial life. So, so, uh, life, life. Uh, so, so, <coughs> that's how, it's, that's what I did uh, straight after, after, um, after, after McKinsey. And they, they gave complete uh, freedom, uh, you know, we're not going to help you with finding, you know, office space, you know, you had to go down to, the, the, the local place where they sold furniture they bought from uh, bankrupt companies and so on. It's it completely like Greenfield Startup. The only thing is, I knew I had money from day one. I didn't know if I would have money after 12 months, but I knew I had money from day one. Okay. That, was, that was really cool of Sipsters. Yeah, it sounds really, really nice. I mean, you don't seem to hear a lot of those kind of deals going on right now. Or... No, and, and uh, <laughs> nope, that's true. Yeah, yeah. What? So, so, so the first company was called so, so right? Sorry, your first company. It's called Scandinavia so Online. Yes, yes, they they had a company in Norway that they own 100% mm -hmm. Scandinavia Online, mm -hmm. and then we said, okay, we're gonna call it the same. That's uh, that, I mean, that that's fine. We can maybe get a little bit of, you know, um, uh, yeah, we could get a little bit of positive effect around the, the fact that it was maybe related to this Norwegian company, which it wasn't, but it was the same name at least. Yeah. Uh, okay, and uh, what does Scandinavia Online do exactly? I mean, what was so. Uh, First, we believed we should make uh, various uh, NIST services within media and e-commerce. Uh, and uh, what we realized after 
uh, nine, ten months or so was that actually we should make a gateway, mm -hmm. or what you call a portal. Uh, so we made a portal, and we started competing with uh, UB, mm -hmm. and uh, Ophia, and uh, Opexia, and uh, whatever we were called back then. Mm -hmm. And we actually managed through a mix of uh, organic growth and uh, a number of small acquisitions to, to build the, the, the second biggest portal in Denmark. Around, we had around two-thirds of the, of, of the users uh, that UB they had. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That sounds pretty well. I mean, how? Why did you then? You must have left left at some point. But I mean, what? So what so uh, so um, uh, so you know that was cool. Uh, and then we 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 what we realized also was that we were just a small standalone company. We we didn't really have a chance to compete against the really big guys, which were Yahoo and Microsoft Network and whatever international players that could that could you know attack us. Back then, Google wasn't really yet uh, on, on the radar. And we didn't have the resources to really uh, develop uh, new products at a world-class level. Just a small you know, Danish company. So we thought, we need to get scale. And the way to get scale is to merge with portals in other countries. And uh, so we, together with uh, some people in the network, uh, we, had, uh, we put together a group of like handful of companies in Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, and Denmark. And there were, uh, uh, some of them were sister companies in the sense that some of them had the same investors. Uh, Shipstead, Telia, and Telnor. And we then uh, agreed as, as, as joint management team, we should do this. And then uh, we would actually create really a juggernaut in the Nordic uh, uh, internet scene. It would be by far the biggest internet media company in the Nordics, which then stock listed raise a lot of money and keep growing in the Nordics and also move into maybe Eastern Europe or something like that. And, um, and then uh, the great plan, the uh, problem was that uh, having big owners uh, across the different companies like Shipstead, Tail and Tail Nord is, is really a mess. And back then, I don't know how many of you guys remember, but, but there was almost a, a war happening between Norway and Sweden because they actually had agreed at, at the highest level to merge Tail and Tail Nord. And you can imagine the kind of politics that went into where should the headquarter be? Where should the headquarter for mobile be? Who should be the CEO? That classic old kind of infighting between Norway and Sweden. And that whole, you know, all that politics screwed up completely our merger. So they blocked it. I think actually it was T who blocked it to piss off <coughs> Tail and Nord. And that was incredibly frustrating because we had something that, that we, we really <coughs> believed in could, could be an instant comedy, at least what we had. As a standalone company, I didn't really believe in, to be honest. But this this bigger thing, I believed in, and um, very exciting. And then they they just blocked it. And I was really pissed off. We 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 uh, we. Uh, uh, I remember I looked into like going to Goldman Sachs and raise a billion krona and buy it from everyone. So a lot of weird things happening. And then finally, uh, one of my Swedish colleagues, he managed to, uh, to 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 basically get hold of the CEO of Telia on a small airfield up north in Sweden. Uh, he just got, he, he stood, you get 10 minutes in, in, in the private jet. And he went in and he managed to, to convince the CEO of Telia that actually he should just forget about this politics, just let us merge and everything would be fine. He said, okay, fine, let's do it. So he managed actually to merge everything. And, uh, and uh, very exciting. And I was told, uh, you, can, you, you can basically pick any, any job you want in, in this new merged entity except CEO. Uh, you won't have a, a, a CEO from, from the outside. So I picked uh, e-commerce, all, all the e-commerce activities, and expansion outside of the Nordics and, uh, and the IPO process. But then in, in the following uh, months, I realized that, that yes, we had created this, this, this company, but the ownership we had, uh, it was still owned like 75% or so, even after stock listing, by these big, big guys that couldn't really agree about anything. So I lost faith in the company. And then I moved on to a new startup. Okay. Which, which was? Mowgli. Oh. Most fantastic startup ever. Okay. Crashed within 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the most fantastic startup ever. Okay, okay. But what did Mowgli do? I mean, just to add on that. So uh, if you kind of roll back to year 2000, you, you, we all had Nokia phones. But what we believed in was uh, we're going to have these one day. We didn't quite know that they would, they would look like this, but we believed that. Uh, you know, 3G was just around the corner. Genuinely, it was just around the corner. And, uh, and 3G-enabled phones, they were just around the corner. And all the telco reports uh, that I read together with my two uh, co-founders, 
said they were just around the corner. Within three years, everybody would be running around with a 3G handset and be, you know, in data roam like hell. And then obviously, you would have a new platform, the 3G enabled mobile phone. We didn't, I don't think we called it smartphones back then. Let's, let's call it a smartphone. But, so, so you would have the smartphone. And if you have a new platform, you need to have you know, services for that platform. Obviously, it's, it's a great new thing. Just like that. when the PC came, in the, in the 10 years I followed, there was an explosion in people uh, adding all kinds of nice software to that. So that's what we wanted to do. And it, it should, you know, ultimately the vision was you know, about the 3G enabling. So we thought, but right now, in, in the beginning of, of uh, 2000, uh, there were no 3G. So how could we get started on this and kind of create a strong position in terms of products, in terms of brand, and in terms of, of user base? Before we had 3G, are we going to use the PDAs? The Palm Pilots, you know, you probably all remember these, these, these uh, nice PDAs. Mm -hmm. So we will start by making software for PDAs. And as soon as they then, uh, we had, then had the 3G enabling uh, products, we would then make sure we in, data enabled these, these software services. And we would then, uh, so that, that's what we want to do. And we would in general not build our own applications. Uh, we would in general source them from ISVs, independent software vendors from around the world. Um, and basically find the, the, the best game, the best utility for this, uh, the best, you know, whatever for that. And brand it with our, uh, our brands and wrap it and service it and market it, the whole thing. That's what we want to do. So that's what we did. And we, we managed to build uh, the second biggest portfolio in the world within this category. Uh, we even had a game that was, that was uh, named the, the best uh, game for the, 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 the Windows <coughs> PC, uh, Windows Pocket platform by, by Wired Magazine and everything was great, uh, except that uh, no, 3G was not right around the corner. <laughs> uh, secondly, the, we had underestimated, we knew there would be some kind of crash in the dot com, that's why we moved on to mobile. But we had completely, I think like everybody else, had underestimated how big the crash was and the impact, impact that had on VCs because they could not fund new companies, they would only fund the existing portfolio companies that, that were in problem. And the third thing, which was not an external problem, that was definitely our own problem, was we funded ourselves completely stupidly. Uh, we, we, were, we, were, we were a good team, we had a great idea, and, and the investors, they loved us. We raised uh, about a bit less than $2 million in our, in our Series A uh, from uh, investors in the US, Europe, and, and Japan. And that was great, and, but we got, we got too short-sighted. We said, hey, you know, we're only going to take $2 million. We could have gotten $5 million. We're only going to take $2 million, and then we're going to go out in seven, eight months, mm -hmm. and then we're going to raise a lot more to the much bigger valuations. That's, that's really smart. <laughs> no, it was not very smart, <laughs> because that killed us. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> so, so there is $2 million in the Series A, but you couldn't have had any, you didn't have any customers back then, or, or what? Or, or nothing. Or yeah, nothing. Okay. We had nothing. PowerPoint, okay, three guys. Was, okay, that was just the way you... You could do it back that, then. That, that's what you could do back then, yes. You can't <laughs> no, do that anymore. Okay. Okay, okay. And, and we even got like a crazy valuation for the company. It's completely insane. <laughs> okay, so how does it feel to, to try to kill uh, to kill the startup? It sounds like you, you, I mean, you really call the best startup <laughs> ever. It was a really cool startup because I think the, 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 the vision we had, the way we pro everything was like really cool. And the team we had, I mean, the, the guys that we, we assembled for this, this journey was a really, really strong team. If you look at what those guys are doing today, today they're all on multiple startups and, and so on. Really, really good, good guys. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if you have to stop it, you have to stop it. There's no way around that. Mm. Okay. How did you find co-founders back then? Because, I mean, now, I mean, every, almost everybody is an entrepreneur now. So, I mean, finding people that want to do So, the guy with the original idea, it's not my, my idea, it was, was an American called uh, Ian. Ian, he had studied uh, at an MBA school with uh, an old uh, McKinsey colleague of mine. Is that kind of how we, we all connected? Okay. All right. Okay. And, 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 so, so it was an LA Copenhagen startup. We basically had, we actually only even had a call in Iceland, Tokyo, but, but basically LA and Copenhagen were the, were the two hubs we had. Okay, okay. Um, okay so, so finding good qualified co founders that were not a big, that has never really been a big they were really, really They were very qualified. Those yeah. Were nice, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, finding them, uh, I mean, how did that happen? Through, through network, did you say, or? Yeah, they, they, yeah. they called. Uh, okay. it, it, was, it, was, it was the, uh, the ex-McKinsey guy who called me and said, listen, 
I have this uh, old friend of mine, he has a great idea. And he says he wants to do this, but I feel more comfortable if, if, if uh, we have one more guy like you. Uh, and then I um, talked to that guy and uh, we agreed that, you know, we, I think we made up in Copenhagen and decided we should do this. Okay, all right. Okay, but I mean, uh, yeah, too bad that didn't work out. And I mean, boy, where, where, where did it go from there? I mean, when then mobility was done and then... So then, then, I, then I, I, I wrote, uh, then, I, then we should have bankrupt. And I, I remember I, I wanted to make sure that the, the whole process of bankruptcy kind of happened in a good way, uh, that it was not a mess. <laughs> Uh, 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 so I, I, I spent a week or two just winding up everything, making sure the lawyers that were you know, taking care of everything. And then uh, obviously you need to think about you know, what you're going to do next. Uh, one, one of the things I did uh, was I, uh, back then I was a bit pissed on the Danish uh, tax situation, so I wrote a, a, big, uh, a big article for, for Berneske uh, on, on, on why the the Danish tax system was wrong. Anyway, that's that's another issue. But but I, I actually I spent two weeks uh, as an interim CEO in a in a, in a software company up in uh, I can't remember somewhere up north, mm -hmm. uh, and came to the conclusion that it was not for me for various reasons. And then I got a call uh, from some of the guys I had known a while at Shipstead, and they said, uh, "Listen, we have we have a company." based in Zurich and um, and uh, you know we, we need a guy to, to the to the management team and we think you could be really you know you could be a good fit we just got a new CEO and he needs he needs a guy like you and and uh, the, 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 this this was a, this was uh, they kind of done it a bit like I did with them uh, a few years earlier so they take a couple of guys uh, with an entrepreneurial instincts and give them a lot of money. But then on top of that, they raised money from a couple of VCs. Apex, which back then had a big uh, tech VC arm, they don't have that anymore, and a Swiss, a Swiss bank. And the company was doing free sheets. So basically what we today in Copenhagen know as, as Metro, uh, but, with, uh, with, but that includes also a, a new media arm. So basically a very, quite a decent focus on, on, on the internet and a little bit on mobile as well. And uh, they need someone to kind of, you know, help with the digital side and also be in charge of expansion. They were in Switzerland when I joined them, and, and had been in Germany. Was closing down Germany after a bit of a, a, a war in the in the German media landscape. It's difficult to invade Germany. We all know that, and, and, and they, they they lost a bit on that one. Um, so I, I came down there, and, and it was, you know, it was it was, um, you know, I, I got a bit away from from from, you know. Uh, uh, Denmark, um, Switzerland is you know it's a beautiful country, nice challenge, uh, and then uh, and then some crazy guys they, they they took some big aircraft and rammed them into some some towers in, in New York, and that kind of changed the media landscape quite a lot. So the whole expansion thing uh, kind of uh, just was gone. So eighty percent of what I should do was gone. So I I, uh, I left that company and also because I met, I reconnected with uh, the woman who's today my wife and she was back home in Denmark. So that was kind of a, both a professional and a private reason for, for leaving. I was in Zurich for I think this, less than a year. Okay. And then you went into some media companies in Denmark, right? Yes. So so then uh, so then I came back home and then uh, I had a like a, a private incentive to not start working like crazy, which, which I had always done since I left the university. I've always been working uh, a lot. So I wanted to, uh, and also um, the whole sort of startup scene uh, globally, if you think about 2002, was not uh, that interesting. Uh, but, but actually that was not really, really. the real reason was I needed to, to, to spend time with my future wife. Um, so, um, so I wanted to have something where I feel I, I built something, but, but it couldn't be like a startup. Um, and um, I, I was approached by someone from, uh, I talked to someone from Berlingske, uh, and they said that Berlingske and Unisposten and Politik had agreed to merge some of their units and activities and content rights into a company that should do media, uh, media uh, content services. Media monitoring, media search, uh, and so on, and um, and they want to hear if I want to to 
start this company. Uh, it would from day one have, I think, 15 uh, employees and some content rights. And, uh, you know, that was kind of you know, building a company, uh, not having to work, uh, you know, crazy, crazy hours. It was kind of a, 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 good, a good fit. So I, I started that and that was actually, uh, that was actually, I spent three and a half years there. It was a nice journey with some very different uh, experiences uh, compared to a normal startup because it was after all related to these big media corporations. Uh, so there were some a few other challenges I had to to uh, to handle. Uh, I remember also that this, this was kind of interesting. I, I so when I came back from from Switzerland, I I talked to some some headhunters. I said, you know, I, I want to look for a job. I'm not really interested in, in startup right now. I think I need to to maybe get kind of a proper job uh, for for a few years uh, and where I don't work too much. And I remember just a couple of years earlier, they had been calling me constantly. And, oh, you are a McKinsey guy, you start up, you know, tag, you're fucking awesome. Hey, we want you. Everybody wants you. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> and now, they're like, we can't use your clouds. Sorry. No. Have you ever run a real company, Klaus? Have you ever earned a profit in your life? We can't use you. We need accountants these days. We need, like, a safe pair of hands, Klaus. I got insanely, insanely upset about that message. And I didn't get it only from one head, I think I got like three different head owners. And I'm like, whoa, you idiots. You're just a bunch of lemmings, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, so I, I, um, I took that, uh, and that, that company is it's called Infomedia. Actually, I call it Infomedia Hooksit. And then later on, we, we, we dropped the Hooksit. So it's called Infomedia. And it got off to a, a bit of a rough start, but but uh, because of some tech issues, but we managed to to overcome that, and it became a, quite a successful company. Okay. That actually disrupted that entire space around media monitoring completely. And one of the very few areas where I know the the, the big media corps in Denmark have actually really disrupted the space. Mm. They were also perfectly positioned to do it, but that's that's another thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and then on your LinkedIn profile, you have a very funny comment for your next kind of gig, which I think is JP Politics, so which is just yes. like, well, well, mm, mm, what, what, <laughs> what's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I was increasingly impressed by what Shifted. I don't know if you guys know Shifted, but again, this is Norwegian. Imagine if you know, uh, you know, classic media corporations with a couple of newspapers and maybe a, a book publishing unit. Uh, that's kind of where ships that they were in the mid-90s. And then uh, over like 10 years, they transformed from that into the most impressive new media corporation in, in Europe, if not the world. If you talk to eBay today, and you ask eBay, who are your toughest competitors in Europe? Who are you most afraid of? They're going to mention ships that. And, and the, the massive, you know, the entirety of what they built in terms of talent pool, tech resources, central functions, you know, local energetic companies, all that is really, truly really amazing. And, and I got a lot of good insights into how they did it. And I was then approached by the chairman I had in this company, uh, Marene, uh, who, who, who's now head of uh, TV2, she's been head of TV2 for quite a few years. She was part of the exec team in in, in, in Politik Institute. They merged at Wine House and Infomedia. And she said, Klaus, and of course I told her, listen, uh, I've been here now for three and a half years, just so you know, I'm looking into uh, doing a startup. Uh, I, I think I've done my service here, you have a great company, it's time for me to move on. And then she came back uh, a week later and said, actually, you should join us, because now at the uh, Politik Institute, we have realized, and this was end of 2005, we realized the internet we should take serious. Whoa. <laughs> whoa, 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 okay, uh, okay. So, um, so what they they create this new role in the in the corp management team uh, where you should have a guy in head, uh, heading up data cell, n- uh, not really being hands on responsible for exit the decor and Pultingo, but building up some stuff and coordinating the rest. And I could see this was a massively tough challenge because I knew a bit about how those kind of companies they function. And uh, it would be a really tough challenge, but I, I liked it. I liked the challenge, and I, I, I had this hope I should make like a mini a mini ship uh, It would be great to have such a company in, in, in Denmark. I think we we need that kind of 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 of, of uh, innovative uh, media cooperation in Denmark. 
And then I joined and I was there for a bit more than two years. And uh, some of the stuff I did worked and some of it did not work. Mm. Some of the stuff that didn't work was, you know, just, you know, you, do, you make errors and you try to, to, you know, to, to change stuff, you, you, you break things and it's not good. But some of the, you know, too many of the things did not work because of internal politics. Mm. And, uh, and it, it, it makes me really feel creepy when, when, when uh, I remember the first year it was kind of good, but the second year I just had all these issues being thrown at me uh, and people doing, doing things that were not in the interest of, 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 the, of the overall company, but entirely in their personal interest with the business unit they were sitting in. And this, I, I have this uh, strong, strong feelings from you know, way back when, when I was a child, you know, playing football and so on. So you were in the trench together. Right, you in the and the enemy is, is over there. The guys here are your, your best best mates. They'll do anything for you. The guys behind you will do whatever they can to support you. The enemy is over there. It is incredibly demotivating when you realize the guys in the trench is trying to knife you. It just does not work. And some people they have the stop on this to just carry on and yada yada yada. And I just I just can't operate in an environment like that for too long. I just can't. So I just realized, you know, I, I, I have to get out of here. Um, and then I started, I didn't have any ideas of my own. Uh, well, I had ideas, but none that were good enough. So I started to talk to uh, a couple of other guys that, that were doing stuff already, uh, existing startups. And then I, I got a call from an old, uh, old friend I hadn't really talked to for a few years. He lived in London. He said, "I, uh, the guy who owns my company, he was running a company over there. He has a big, he has a majority stake in another company called Just Eat. It's it's actually kind of a Danish company. Uh, have you heard about? It? Yeah, I kind of heard about it. They're doing some pizza stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they're looking for for a guy uh, to run it because a while ago the old CEO, he left the company. Okay, let, let me be. And then I met the the main shareholder, which is uh, a Dane but living abroad, been living abroad for 25 years." And and uh, did some research over a month, and then I realized actually this could be quite interesting. So I joined the company. Very cool. And this is March, April 2008. Okay. And did you know that when when you joined that, that just it really kind of had what it takes to my to mean? Of I mean, course I didn't know that, but I knew that there was the basic analysis I did was just eat had already created. <coughs> Uh, some level of success in Denmark. They actually built a company that earned money in Denmark. They didn't really have anything, 90% of the revenues that were in Denmark. So they didn't really have anything outside of Denmark. And what they had outside of Denmark didn't, didn't, uh, didn't really, uh, too many of those things didn't work. But it did work in Denmark. And I also could see that there were a number of other companies around Europe, in the US, and in Japan that were doing more or less the same thing then that also seemed to kind of have traction. So, you know, these companies individually of each other had traction in different markets. And there were no big international player. And then I thought, hmm, maybe this could actually be, maybe this could actually be, uh, be, be uh, uh, an opportunity to create, you know, the world leader. That's always what, you know, what you want to do. You want to create the world leader. When we did the Mobley, the, the, the mobile startup, that we always talked about, you know, we want to make the world leader. I remember once uh, someone asked me, are you not afraid of Microsoft? And I said, no, we don't fear Microsoft because we are global. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's what you want to, you want to build that really, the number one company in the world. So, so um, I don't think anyone had seen in that space that you could build like truly big companies. But you had some companies here and there that, that had traction. Right, okay. So, so, uh so the headquarters was in London, do you know why? why I, I can't, uh, I wouldn't say there was, if there were, uh, so formerly the company, uh, did, what is the headquarter? Formerly the headquarter was in Gibraltar, okay. legally, which is stupid. In reality, the headquarter was in Aarhus. Okay. It had been, been moved up a few years earlier from, from Colin. Mm -hmm. But in Aarhus is where the tech, there were four tech guys that were sitting in Aarhus. It is where you know you had the, the Danish company, which was ninety percent of the revenues. It's where you had the most uh, kind of powerful guy in the company, which was the guy running Denmark. Uh, it's where you had uh, you know most of the expertise. You had you know most of the employees they were in Denmark uh, run out of Aarhus. So so Gibraltar or Aarhus, depending on 
the perspective you have on things. Right, okay. But but I mean, you had to start off in London, or were you starting? So in what I agreed with with the, this with the majority owner was that I should go to London to check out if, if that was the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the plan <laughs> that he had, and he had made it together with the old CEO and some advisors, was that the key thing was to get into Germany and, and build up. Uh, there was, a, there was, there was, a, there was a, 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 a guy running a company in Germany, and he had traction. We should immediately go to Germany, because that's the biggest you know, country in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. We should immediately go into Germany and try to, to kind of you know, build the big German company. And uh, it would be good if I was kind of in London uh, as a start, because that's close to where all the money is mm. in Europe. And I, uh, you know, I, I could see some logic to that, but but it was not like you know we, we need to establish a headquarter now in London. That, that wasn't really the the point. Okay, okay, okay. But so you had to move your whole family to London, right? Or yes. So so or? so uh, at the time we were expecting our third child, mm. and uh, my wife wanted to to give birth at Hillerød Hospital, where, where she gave birth also to the, the two other children. And I think that, that was a fairly, uh, that, that was a fair, fair argument. Uh, not to move her while she was like massively pregnant. Mm -hmm. So um, I had the first, actually, first I had two months where I was working only part-time because I had to get out of Jørgen Bull mm -hmm. And then I had, uh, I think, a couple of months where I worked out of, uh, out of my farm, uh, flying back and forth. Uh, a bit in Aarhus, quite a bit here and a bit in London. Mm -hmm. And then uh, our boy, he came out uh, 16 days too late, which was not part of my plan. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> my plan <laughs> fucked up because of him. <laughs> and, uh, but then he came out, a big boy, uh, almost five kilos. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then my wife came home, and basically two days after the, he came out, uh, I said, listen, I have ordered tickets now for in two days. We have to go now. Uh, I really need to get over there, and uh, it was really the most chaotic period in my life uh, to move uh, with a. Uh, you, I don't think it's allowed today to fly with a four four day old uh, baby. It's <laughs> okay. It probably wasn't allowed either, but but then we moved over there. It's really chaotic and so on. So I got over there. I think uh, late late August. Uh, late August was it? Yes. All right. Okay. What? I mean, what did your wife do? I mean, she had to quit a job. She she or? yeah she. Uh, She's in, uh, she's in chemistry, mm -hmm. um, but she worked, uh, so we had two kids already, so worked, she worked part-time uh, as a teacher for, for at, a, at, a, at a lab school, basically a place we educate labs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, but so you moved the whole uh, family to, to yes. London and... Uh, uh, and she quit her job. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 she had to quit okay. her job. I mean, okay, yeah. okay. Did you start on something new in London, or no. was she? No. <laughs> I was at home, and we had three children. No, she didn't oh, do okay. something. Okay, <laughs> okay. 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 That sounds cool. I mean, how how did you break it to where I mean the first time that okay, so now I I, I want to get this job and, and, it, it, and it was uh, it was um, it was for some reason she was very very uh, co collaborative. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but she was. <laughs> cool. she, she, I think she felt yeah, I think it would be cool to. And her view was, and I kind of bought into that one, was we're going to go over, if we do this, we're going to go over there for one year. And I also said, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of risk, and I could list all the risks uh, that were associated with this with this venture. And uh, maybe we would come home after a year. You know, I, I, what, what, I, what I told uh, the, the owners of the company was, I'll, I'll go to London, and let's see what makes sense after a year. But maximum, I'm there for three years, maximum. Then I will go home. I... I I don't want to be an expat. Mm -hmm. I, do, I want my children to grow up in, in Denmark. It's the best place on the entire planet to have a family. So that's just how it's going to be. After three years, maximum. This, yeah, fine, that's fine, whatever. And, uh, and, and she was fine with, you know, maybe after a year we're going to return. And maximum, maximum, if, 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 it kind of, if, if, if you like it, three years, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I needed to find a good, a good home, you know, a, 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 you know, we need to have a good private settings. Uh, so we need to find okay home, the small garden after London. Uh, Standard's pretty big garden, but compared to where I'm from, tiny, tiny garden, and and, and a good uh, state school for the for the children. We could walk to the school and kind of work with the tube line compared. To, so there was a number of things that 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 was important to have. 
the family in, in, in a place, so I, I knew that it, it's going to be a, a, a good experience for everybody. But we managed to, to sort that out, including doing a little bit of document fraud. But let's not get into detail. <laughs> <laughs> Could you please turn that thing on? <laughs> All right. So as so, a CEO of uh, just either mean uh, at that particular stage in 2008, I mean, what was your main kind of uh, thing that you had to do that was scaling or overall? Understand the company, understand the... Uh, there were there were no. I mean, you have to imagine that the company was 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 this uh, you know merger back in two thousand one of of two companies. They came together and they built the company in a very bootstrap way, uh, with a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, uh, not with a lot of uh, like tech insight, not with a lot of insight into uh, you know how you professionally do this and that, but with a lot of entrepreneurial energy. And you can imagine after seven years of having worked in that way, uh, you have created this Danish success that actually earns money. And you fine tune a lot of things. Uh, but there's also a lot of stuff that have accumulated in the company. It's around uh, the culture, it's around uh, the kind of organization, it's a kind, you know, around the technology, around the products. Both some very soft factors and some very hard factors. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, a, a lot of a lot of things uh, had to, to, to be dealt with. But at, at the core, obviously, you at the core you had a concept that worked, yeah. which is pretty pretty good. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, in, in, in quite a few of the you know, the videos and some of the blog posts I've read, I mean, you talk a lot about the culture. Just even how was that like? I mean, how did you shape it? And I mean, how did you kind of work with the culture? Um, <coughs> so there were, you know, the the the, the culture. Uh, there were some really good things uh, in the culture uh, when 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 I joined. Things that I I carried uh, into the next few phases of the company, and which I think is 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 to some extent still there in the company today, even though it's it's a massive company today. And there were other parts of the culture that I knew I had to kill if this company should be more than just a, a daily startup. Mm -hmm. So on the positive side, you know, you had you know entrepreneurial energy. You know, lots of that. You had, you know, I think a good sort of creativity around how to to, to solve solve problems uh, at, at the basic level. Um, that actually impressed me a little bit. I think that that, that was really cool. Um, on the um, and, and, and and very cost conscious, very cost conscious. We are uh, from Jordan. We are very cost conscious in Jordan. You know, that, that, that's really cool as well. You need that when you run a company bootstrapped in so many years. On the negative side, actually, was cost consciousness, because it became a very short-sighted cost consciousness. And if you want to build something big, you need to invest. You need to dare. You need to risk to invest long term. And that was really against uh, kind of how the company had been run for for a long term. Ideally, I would have joined that company two years earlier. That would have been even then. Then okay. just eat would today also have been number one in the US. That would be pretty cool. There was also something around, uh, you know, kind of the, 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 la the, the, the laddishness, a very laddish culture, sort of, you know, locker room, locker room atmosphere. Lots of, lots of guy, young guys uh, running around, uh, doing all sorts of things. And there is, without going into detail, but there is kind of, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I think I'm a fun-loving character. I like to, to have fun. I, I have a pretty, you know, positive view of the world. And, and like, like, you know, every day you need to laugh, you know, a lot of times. And most of the time, I actually need to be laughing and so on. But there's just some stuff you don't do. And it's both related to, you know, ethical things. And it's also related to almost like legal things. You just don't do that. And it's, it's one thing is you don't do it. But secondly, I'm against it. Personally, and thirdly, it does not scale. From a business perspective, working like that does not scale. You can build companies on that. I don't believe you can build proper big companies like that. So, f for a number of reasons, you know, you had to. I had to kind of take care of that. And you have to remember that the situation was that I was I was a new guy. I did not know anyone in that company, um, and they and and all the you know, the handful of core guys in the company. They've been, they've been together for a while, and they've become very close friends. 
and uh, and also very close friends with the former CEO who's also a co-founder of the company and a, a big shareholder of the company. So I had to get into that and actually tell everybody, you know, after a few months, I have an overview now, and this has to change, you can't do this anymore, blah, blah, blah. I need to do that without, um, you know, still making sure the company can move forward while actually getting a lot of flack from some people that, of course, believed that what I was doing was destroying the company and destroying the culture that they liked. So that first, you know, first year, first 12 months or so was quite challenging from a leadership perspective. There was a lot of other challenges as well around all the usual things. But from a leadership perspective, I think that was the most challenging bit for the first 12 months. But it worked out well. And it took, it took about, about 12 months. Okay. You have some good war stories from back then? I mean, something that uh, went uh, straight out of the line? Or then he had to turn off that. <laughs> 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 right, well, we can take them in the bar after I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How, how did your role kind of like change, change with, the, with the company moved? Uh, I mean. So, uh, and of course, changed a lot, right? I mean, the, when I started, I was the CEO. I was also the, the CFO, mm-hmm. and I was the the, the the best dev guy, and I was also the COO, if you kind of know. <laughs> but, but you know, that's quite normal. That that's how it is uh, when you have that stage, and the and and the and the CEO role, the organization has not been developed. That's kind of how it is. That's fine. Uh, it's it's a little bit uh, tricky and risky and all that. But that's that's kind of fine. Uh, the first role I got rid of was the CFO role. Uh, I hired a guy. Which, which, which I hired a guy. He is CFO today. So to a to a, to, a, to a small, you know, bootstrapped uh, company selling pizzas online, I managed to hire a, a guy who's CFO for a Fuji 250 company today. Same guy. That was a good hire, and I hired him after like half a year. Actually, around the same time, I hired another guy. He, that guy is British. Another guy. He was actually hired uh, a few weeks earlier, but started a, a bit later. It's a Danish guy called Rasmus Wolf, one of the most talented people I've ever come across. Anyone who can work with him should be really happy about that. He's with uh, he's he's with Get Your Guide in Berlin today. So I, I managed to get hold of him, and then I also had the whole BizDev side taken care of. The COO role, I was also chief marketing officer. I was also CMO, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, the COO role I had for a long time yet. That's the role I kept for quite a while. The CMO role I got rid of in the summer of 2009, where I hired another guy who's also today the chief marketing officer for Just Eat, and we have won a ton of marketing awards. In the, pretty much every single award you can win in the UK, best search, best social media, best creative, this, best PR, that, and so on. And you know he's spearheaded uh, all of that. Really good guy as well. Uh, and then you know so 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 you, you're very hands on in the beginning, obviously. And then you know as as the comic grows, you have to kind of find people to take over uh, and focus more and more on 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 strategy, culture, and and investor relations. The last bit. Uh, I don't like the two other bits. I love. Mm. Okay, so it seems funny that Helmi, you are a basically grown up in farmer country. You are call yourself a farmer now, and now you took over just eat, and then you had to kind of had a very international mindset. I mean, you don't normally kind of I guess at least I don't really associate farmer country with. Uh, are you are you are you a practice farmer? <laughs> <laughs> Is that like what you're saying? No, sorry, no, 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 no. no. Anyway, uh, maybe a little bit. I don't know. Where are you going with this one? Where are you going with this one? Where I'm going is how did you develop a kind of like international? I, I, I told you that I was very interested in political science. Mm-hmm. I'm very uh, massively interested in history. And if you have those interests, you will naturally, uh, naturally, have an international view of the world. So I uh, traveled a lot. Uh, and remember McKinsey? Yes, I formerly had a had a desk in Copenhagen, but in reality, I was not in Copenhagen. Uh, I studied uh, abroad, uh, you know, lived in Zurich, uh, lived in Germany, um, Mobley was, was, was in LA, and, and co- so, you know, over time, uh, you kind of build some, some, some proper national ex- international experience as well. Okay, all right, okay, okay. That makes sense, I guess. Um, uh, so, so in, in 2013, you then left Just Eat? I mean, uh, were you happy with that? I guess at that time, I guess I seem to remember that you 
your family moved back to Denmark and you No, so, so the, the problem was I had said three years. Mm. And I actually meant that. Mm. And my wife meant that. So we moved back home. And uh, I had always been transparent. Also, as we got new investors on board, we constantly, every year we got some new bonds of money and new investors and new board members and so on. Mm. And I was always pretty open. You know, after three years, I'm going to move back home. Don't worry about that. And then I actually did move back home. Mm. And they were really upset about that. Okay. Really upset about that. Uh, and I told them, don't worry about that. There's a thing called uh, the internet and there's a thing called airplanes. So I'm going to run the company even better. Uh, going forward, uh, 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 and I did. Uh, I had a personal plan. The personal plan was that I should, you know, I I, I started. To, I was from the beginning. We're going to IPO, but you, when you talk about a small company, you want to IPO it. It's just bullshit, right? Of course, you don't know. But then, as as the years they they they, they passed, I realized actually this is the right thing for this company, and we can do it. So I knew we're going to do the IPO. I felt. Pretty certain about that. So my personal plan was do the IPO and leave the company twelve months later. I don't think I'm the kind of guy that will enjoy running a public company for a number of reasons. Uh, there, there are two problems with that. Point one: as a CEO with and and in the kind of CEO I was for that company, you don't uh, leave after twelve months if you also do the IPO. You can, that is lying to everybody. Now you can't be in front of institutional investors in New York and tell them, you know, don't worry, I'm going to run this company for many, many years. You can, you can trust me, your money. I'm going to make sure that you know, we take care of them and, and we give you a good return. You can't, you can't do that. Mm. It's lying to everybody. That's problem number one. Problem number two was I had hoped, so when I moved back home in spring, summer 2011, I had hoped we could do the IPO in 2012. That meant I would have to, then I could leave in 2013 which meant I would only have two years where I would be commuting back and forth, which is incredibly tough. Mm. I mean, it was uh, oh, tough. I only had two things in my life. I had my, my job and my children. Nothing about me, nothing about my wife, nothing about my friends, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just my job and my children. And, and uh, some people, they can do that forever. I can't. Um, now, that, that problem um, came under pressure. Because I realized that if we, if you have to find the right times, there's a number of things, long story about when does it make sense to, to, to stop this company. And I could see ah, it did not make sense in, in 2012. And then I realized it couldn't make sense either in 2013. And, and, uh, and so um, I ended up in a situation where even if I stretched and, and added time to my timeline for the amount of time I should be in the company and how I could work like that, I would, you know, there would, there would be an IPO and I would leave like six months later. Uh, that wouldn't work. So, it wouldn't work. Secondly, my dear owners, which I had a lot of, they, they uh, started talking about that I should move back to London. And they actually kind of gave me a fait accompli, you know, you have to move back to London. Set in the British way. Mm. I think you should consider to come back to London. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know what they're actually saying, right? They say, get back here. <laughs> And, and they also got some insight into my personal plan around how I could, you know, uh, so that didn't, it, it just didn't work out. So, uh, so in, in sort of Christmas 2012, uh, 13, I, I took the decision, and which was a tough one because I loved the company to bits, I loved it, and I would have loved to do that IPO. Okay, fuck it, I have to leave because it's not, you know, I have to do what's the right thing with the company, however, so, so leaving was not, that was not, uh, Controversial, but then what happened was that the chairman, um, he came to me and said, "Okay, so we agree, you should be leaving now." Yes, okay. Back and forth, and my plan was obviously yes, okay. Now we agree, I'm going to leave, but I should spend a few more months in the company, help to find a new CEO, you know, migrate to you know new guy, blah blah blah. blah. But his view of the world was very different. He said to me, Klaus. In my, and he's, he was like 60 or whatever, in my long experience, when you have a situation like this with the CEO and chairman of Greece, the best thing is that you part immediately. And I was like, yeah, well, I'm going back to the office to have my men's meeting with the guys. No, you're not. You are leaving now. You're going to the airport and you fly back to Denmark. That's it. Done. I was like, really? Yes, really. 
So that was, you know, that kind of was was a, a step change in how uh, things they were handled at the company. You know, it was a new time. Uh, I, I was both CEO and chairman of the company the first four years, which worked out really well. Uh, I actually wanted it was me who was pushing for a chairman because I wanted to have less time with the investors and more time with the company. So I wanted to have a chairman to take care of us. But he came in and it was just. That's kind of what happens when you build companies of that size. Uh, that the chairman he wants to 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 be more in charge, and uh, if he felt that uh, the CEO he had to leave immediately instead of migrating over a few months, that's the way it should be. Mm. That was real tough. I had not seen that one coming. I had assumed we should just agree and then slowly you know migrate out and say hello to everybody and you know say goodbye to everybody and so on. That was that was uh, that was a bit different. Okay. Okay. But they were, in terms of how the company then treated me, was exceptionally good. I mean, everything else was exceptionally good. I mean, okay. way above what anyone could, could wish. Okay, that's good to hear. On all other dimensions. Yeah, I actually made a really, really cool a homemade uh, farewell You've seen that video. one? Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's on YouTube, so just go Google Klaus farewell video or something like that. You'll find yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Very uh, amateur, like uh, I, I film everybody with everything with my, <laughs> with my iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it would be cool. Uh, okay, so, uh, so so maybe turn 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 a little bit away from Justy because we are running a little bit out of time. I just want to talk about what you are doing now. Uh, you just mentioned that you didn't really like to spend time with investors, but uh, am I not completely wrong by saying that now you are an investor? I, it depends on what kind of investors we're talking about, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a lot of really cool investors out there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certain kinds of, of, of situations, and you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm an investor myself. Uh, I, I, so, so what happened? I, I knew that for a long time before I left that that what I wanted to do. Uh, I did not want to be a VC. Uh, I've had a lot of people coming to me asking, "Don't you want to be a partner in this or that?" And it's quite a natural progression uh, if you look at my background. But I just think uh, it's too early for me just to be an investor. Uh, not, not just it, it's difficult to be investors to be honest it, it really is but I also still want to be uh, an entrepreneur mm -hmm. so I'm sort of caught a little bit in between trying still to be involved in, in a few things mm -hmm. and then in other uh, projects I'm, I'm more of a normal angel investor so not a lot involved money connections that's it mm -hmm. so I'm trying you know, some 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 projects I'm really trying to be involved in some in between and some I'm really hands off it's just Bit of money, connections, that's it. So I'm, I'm in between, okay, okay, okay. which is not necessarily easy to juggle. Uh, and, and I knew it would take me some time to try and understand how that model should work for me. And I think I'm getting there like 80%. Okay, okay. that's cool. Yes, right now you're uh, you a little bit in four or five companies, right? Church, Desk, Sequoia, Wahanda. And no, a lot more. A lot more, a lot more. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, those are the ones I found on your blog, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, but I mean, uh, so what's next? Are you gonna are you gonna go into farming or nuclear power? Nuclear power. <laughs> nuclear power. Nuclear power. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. No, okay. Where, where is he sitting? There we go. <laughs> nuclear power. Definitely. Nuclear power. No, yeah. um, I mean I, I'm pretty much fully booked. Okay. I, if if uh, if you look at what I'm doing today uh, and the stuff I will be doing but not announced, I'm fully booked. Mm. Okay. Right. So I, I, I I I have two main main focuses. One is is uh, consumer e-commerce, or more specifically on our marketplaces, and other thing is workflow management solutions. Okay. Uh, I do also investments outside of that, like nuclear power, but then it's driven by like some weird personal angle, you know, whatever, where I think, okay, this is actually really cool, I need to do this also. Uh, but I, I try to have my main time and main uh, money commitment to, to those two categories. All right, okay. okay. Well, I think with that, I think we're going to open it up to the, to the room, if anybody have any questions they want to ask. Are you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so you had a lot of interesting stories, but actually when, when you talk about Jeff so, uh I was mostly uh, <coughs> interested in the backstory because I grew up with uh, Nesta Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you could... Yes, uh, end of DK. Uh, yeah, exactly. If you could uh, get a bit of a backstory. I don't know how involved you were in that, but... I was... Uh, so what happened was that uh, there was a program on TV2 a youth program 
And then some of the guys uh, running that TV program, they said we should have something instant related also in connection to this program. I can't remember what the program was called. Uh, and then they made this instant. They, they, they found some uh, small web agency, as we called it back then, that, that uh, actually located quite close to this place, that, that would do some kind of you know, uh, community thing. Uh, and out of that grew Nestation, which became N.DK that, that, that bought that domain. And, uh, and they actually got, uh, they probably had the strongest, strongest youth community in Denmark in, in the late 90s. Quite an innovative platform in terms of the avatars you could run around and talk to each other. It was quite, quite sophisticated actually, compared to even international standards. And as I said, Scandinavia Online, we grew to from nothing compared to UB to two thirds. It was a mix of organic and acquisitions. And this has shown was probably the most important acquisition we did in order to get up to, to, to that level. So we, we felt we need to have some kind of youth community. It's tough to build from scratch. And then uh, I managed to make a, a basically a, a, a good deal with, with the guys from, from this as well. And we kind of integrate a little bit into, in, into our, uh, our universe. Uh, but this has shown after a couple of years, slowly faded out. I mean, it just, it just yeah, it's faded out. I think also what happened was that Scandinavia Online did the IPO and after and I actually earned quite a lot of money on paper on that IPO but then of course what happened within 12 months to just the whole thing luckily I didn't buy a Ferrari so that's good <laughs> um, and then it was acquired by Eniro the Yellow Pages company because Scania Online across the Nordics had a lot of traffic and some of the services were kind of interesting for them but other services were not necessary was not at all instant they, they just got it as part of the package so it was just put in a corner and just slowly died which was a bit of a pity. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's more questions. I and mean, when you think about questions, I have one to you as well. Um, it sounds like you were extremely lucky to find the right people to work with. Um, and it also sounds like you have very strong... It's not entirely luck, I have to admit. Yeah, what is kind of the, the, the trades you're looking for? And how, do you, how do you find the people you, you work with? What are the values you can kind of go for? <laughs> Jotland? People from Jotland? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have this concept I coined uh, a few years ago, uh, I call it interprofessional, which, which I, I want to trademark and publish a book and be really famous and all that shit, one day. But what interprofessional, and, and I, because I, real, I, I put a name on something I, I, I've been known for quite a while. But what it is, is people. Now you have the classic entrepreneurs, with uh, you know green hair and lots of crazy ideas, building rockets and so on, and you have uh, the professionals, jacket and tie and, and 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 very rational, strategic resource allocation and so on, and and really what you and, and these two uh, stereotypes they don't like each other, they don't trust each other, right? Corporate wankers, crazy guys. <laughs> In reality, when you build great companies, when you really build great companies, you need someone. You need a lot of people that can bridge between these two mindsets. You need what I call answer professionals. So people that are able to see in this context, I need to be like super creative and opportunistic like hell. and break a few rules. In this context, I actually need to streamline the hell out of this process, like super professionally. That's the kind of people that, uh, that from a skill set, I like to work with. And the second thing is, and that's a more difficult tool to figure out that is that that uh, they have uh, you know that they are likable in the long run that you can, you can work with them you 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 get sympathy for them something that motivates me a lot uh, is you know you need to create success for each other right you need to invest in someone to help them to become successful then they're going to invest in you so you become successful and in order for that mechanism uh, to to take place you need to have sympathy for each other do you want to help a guy to, get, to become successful if you really think he's an idiot? Not really. But if you really think he's a super guy or super girl, you, you, you want to invest in that person. You think it's great that this guy is a successful guy. This guy can become a role model for the world. Then the world will be a better place. If he's an idiot, you don't want him to become, become successful. You don't want to invest in him. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, it's, it's a, it gives a but, but the whole thing about you know uh, the discussion about how do how do you calibrate and filter the people you want to work with is a that you know that's a that's a long discussion. Right? It's a very long discussion. 
just a f there was a few inputs from myself. It's a good insight and gives an impression of why you have been very successful in finding those people, right? I also made some massive errors, but I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> More questions from the floor. Yes, please. Uh, what are your uh, relation to the co-founder of Jesper Cook today? I, 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 I actually, uh, I thought you were going to ask that one, <laughs> but you didn't. Uh, I have no relationship uh, to Jesper Hook today. We fell out massively, um, actually not long after I joined the company. Uh, the first few months we tried to make it work, and I was actually quite optimistic after the first couple of months. But then uh, things just turned uh, sour, and we rapidly uh, realized that we, we, we had massive problems with this other. And, and then uh, I had to uh, ask him to kind of, you know, he, he was supposed to be an advisor for me, and I had to kind of ask him not to be that anymore and kind of just keep completely out. He lived in Spain. He, he moved. He's still living in Spain, I think. And, uh, and later on, there was a massive conflict around uh, the first funding round we did. Uh, uh, which also then got, got, got settled. And then after that, he was no, he was still uh, a smaller shareholder, but at least he did not have a board position anymore, so I would not need to have a formal dialogue with him. And that actually really, I think, really helped the, the company, that we didn't have that conflict in the company anymore. Uh, but we fell out massively. Um, and, and later on, we had a, a few skirmishes as well. He's published a book where he, uh, he writes not necessarily very kindly about me. Uh, <laughs> And it's just really bad karma between between him and me. And no, no need to go into depth with, with, with why. It's it's just really bad match between uh, him and me. Yes, please. Um, I believe that a lot of great learners come from failure, right? Um, so what would you consider one of your biggest failures? You said that, for example, you asked for two instead of half million uh, yes. investment in the Series A. But apart from that, yeah, I mean, the, 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 for sure, the thing about making sure you have funding for quite a while compared to your business plan is, is always a good thing. Sometimes you don't have that, 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 that choice. You don't have the luxury of that choice. Then you just have to take what you can get and hope for the best. But if you have the luxury of being able to risk in, an, in very uncertain environments, like you know, pre-revenue uh, pre phase, and you can raise a lot of money, just raise the money, right? Just, just do it as much as possible. Uh, so that, that, that's one of the learning I got in the hard way very early on. But then there, there, there's learnings around uh, I remember once, also while I scanned it online, I, I acquired a small service, a uh, small internet service, and after that we were depending on the guys we bought it from to, to do maintenance of, of this service, because we didn't have the, the tech resource in-house or, or insight into doing it. And uh, it created all kinds of problems, because it, from my perspective, no names mentioned, from my perspective, these guys were crooks. And I remember, and I kind of knew that when we did the deal, but they, ah, that's okay, we're going to do the deal, great. <laughs> But you just don't, 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 uh, just don't uh, do deals with crooks. I mean, you have to be incredibly desperate if you do something with people that you can't trust. And it's very tempting to do it when you're in a tight spot and need a bit of money, or you can do a nice deal, or it's just, <coughs> just don't do it. It's just not worth, you know, go and do something else. Uh, and then there's a lot of learnings around, exactly, finding right people. Lots of learnings around that, but I think, it will take hours and hours to talk through all of We can move that to the bar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two more questions, maybe. Yes, please. Um, I was wondering, like, so some might consider 2008 to 2013 to be, like, the worst years, like, in terms of the financial crisis and all these kind of things. How was that, like... It was great for sitting pizza, so I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good thing for you. Or Remember, when you are trying to uh, penetrate a market uh, and you start from zero, in Denmark, it was not zero, but in all our countries, it was pretty much zero. Uh, then it doesn't matter where the market goes up and down, 5 or 10%, it doesn't matter, right? Because you are trying to penetrate the market bottom up. But on top of that, actually, the takeaway market did grow throughout the financial crisis faster, uh, well, obviously faster than the GDP, but actually faster than normal GDP as well. It, it, it grew a few percentage, but it did not have any impact on the success of the online takeaway model. It was because we just had a... Uh, a better approach to it, so we penetrated the, the, the market. Okay, one last question. Hi, Juan Culture. Um, you built a company that grew to be really big and really successful, right? And when you came in, you said you had a big difficulty building a culture. What exactly did you do for the company that, you know, 
what do you ingrain in the company when you just started that made it so successful? And able and that's, that's also a very long discussion, but I think uh, <laughs> you know you have to uh, you have to, to there's a couple of HR decisions you have to take around you know people if they should be in the company and what roles they should have in the company, and 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 that linked with other very visible decisions. Uh, you used to send some very strong signals, and then you 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 you, you live by by those values yourself, and you are very you know you you are very strict on those values, and you are very strict on everybody else as well on on those few values that really matters to you. Um, that's it. I mean, it, 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 you, you have to figure out what is it you want. What is it you want from from your organization? And and you have to communicate it clearly, and you have to take the full consequence of that of that communication. Right. So if there is a guy who's pretty good at what you're doing, but he's a dickhead, yeah. if you can't change him, and often you can't, you can't have him. You just can't. Or he can't have that role. He needs to be in a very different, more junior role, or whatever. Or maybe you know, um, and be very. I I I usually say that that uh, you know. You have to be really tough on the soft issues. You have to be hard on the soft issues. And the soft issues are often the hardest. They're, they're the ones that really have a hard impact on your organization and the performance in the long run. Culture drives everything. Okay, well, I think um, that's uh, time to wrap up. Thank you very much, Klaus, for coming. Good. Let's give him a huge applause. Little around at the bar, everybody else as well. So if you move down and we just hang around for a little longer. Thank yeah, you very much. Sure.